Hello everyone and a warm welcome to this recorded webinar, Community and Dementia, Creating Better Lives in Dumfriesen Gallery. My name is Alan Crockett and I'm the Director of Evidence and Influencing for the Dementia Programme here at the Life Changes Trust. I want to start with a bit of background to this webinar, which is part of a series of Creating Better Lives regional events the Life Changes Trust has been running since 2018, engaging with all 14 local health board areas across Scotland. For all of our regional events, the Life Changes Trust works in partnership with local stakeholders, people living with dementia and the unpaid carers of people who have dementia, as well as others in the community who support individuals, families or projects. In this webinar, we'll be showing three films featuring local projects in the Friesen Gallery, who share some of their work and how they have been coping during the pandemic to support people living with dementia and also unpaid carers. We'll be hearing from Claire Martin, who is a specialist occupational therapist with NHS in Friesen Gallery, some of the local Alzheimer's Scotland team and the people they work with, as well as Michelle Bourne, who is an IDEAS specialist occupational therapist. IDEAS stands for Interventions for Dementia, Education, Assessment and Support. First though, we are going to talk about storytelling. Prior to all of our regional events, we offer storytelling sessions to people living with dementia, unpaid carers and those who work with and support them. These sessions are designed to find out what is most important to them and their communities and what their priorities are for creating better lives. These sessions work by using creative methods to support people to tell their own story. Storytelling is simply a gentle, practical way to do this. We will shortly be hearing from Dan Serridge from the Village Storytelling Centre, who, along with his team, ran these sessions in the Friesen Gallery. But first, we're going to find out more about how storytelling actually works. At the Trust's Creating Better Lives conference in Ayrshire and Arran way back in 2019, Sam Rowe from the Village Storytelling Centre explained. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm not Arlene, I am Sam, you might notice that. Uh, I work for an organisation called the Village Storytelling Centre, and over the last year, we've been working with the Life Changes Trust to develop this storytelling approach, which you might have heard uh, being talked about. Uh, and so I just want to tell you a little bit about the process that has led us to the priorities that you'll find on your table. Um, we are an organisation that uses storytelling to support communities to find their voice, uh, uh, and um, we've been working in collaboration with another storyteller called Claire Hewitt, who uh, has a background in the Living Voices project, which worked in care homes across Scotland, gathering stories from the residents there. Uh, and so uh, our workshops, which we've been instigating, uh, they normally begin by gathering everyone together. And we always start off with a song and a traditional story. And that just gives a feeling for, this is a different kind of meeting. Claire put it really nicely, I think, when she said people think they're coming to a meeting. And what we try to create is the atmosphere of gathering around a kitchen table just to share. Um, but that story will often have thematic connections to some of the concerns that the group might be carrying. And we'll use that story then to kind of start off leading the conversation. It might be a story about building relationships, or it might be a story about community or a supportive society. And we'll let the kind of ball start rolling with that. So it kind of starts the conversation off from a kind of different and unusual place. Sometimes that conversation is enough. Sometimes people have come to that meeting kind of with a lot that they wish to share, and we, can, we just kind of give them the space to speak and to listen. But also we have the option to kind of like move into the next stage, which is to actually use a story creating process to support people to share some of their thoughts and feelings. And that normally revolves around creation of a character. So if we're working with a group of carers, uh, we might create a, a fictionalized character who uh, shares some of their experiences, who we could imagine being a member of the group that, that, that we're sitting in. And that character gives people the space to kind of project onto it, uh, onto him or her, some of their own experiences, which gives them uh, the chance to uh, regulate their own level of personal disclosure, but also find the space perhaps to share some things that they might find painful to kind of like to talk about if, if there was too much personal focus. So for example, in another area, we talked about family conflict. So I don't know if that was happening in the participants' lives, but by being able to talk about this character, we were able to really explore those issues in a really open and kind of supportive manner. 
the other approach that we might use then is also to kind of introduce an overnight bag that belongs to a person perhaps living with dementia. And in that bag, there'll be all sorts of thematic objects that we've picked up from the previous discussions that we've had. And we'll pass those around to the participants and ask them to talk about those and what it might mean to this character who owns this bag. So that might include doctor's letters or a driver's license, which is now out of date, or a set of keys. Uh, we might ask who helped pack that bag. Uh, and that gives people the space, again, to just sort of talk about some of the things that they have been, uh, that, that are important to them through the prism of this fictionalized storytelling process. Um, we listen to the, all these conversations and then we distill down what we hear into the priorities kind of afterwards, working along with uh, uh, the, the Life Trip, the Trust itself. Uh, and then obviously this is handed on to you at the, the conference. And this is the first time I've been able to uh, attend the conference, so I'm really excited to see this next part of the process and how what all we've discussed over the last couple of days is, uh, is going to go forwards and just to hear your discussions. I'm going to hand over to Anna now, who is going to just introduce some of those priorities that, that we've identified. So thank you very much. Thanks to Sam for explaining a bit more about how storytelling works so that people can tell their own story and have their voices heard. As I said earlier, prior to all of our regional events, we invite people living with dementia, unpaid carers, and those who work with and support them to take part in storytelling sessions. After the sessions, all of the conversations and stories we've heard help form a set of local priorities based on what people have told us. Our storytelling sessions in the Friesen Gallery involve those who support people with dementia and unpaid carers, and unpaid carers themselves, and what they told us is then reflected in the local priorities. As always, we invite people with dementia to participate in the sessions in a way that would suit them, but understandably it has become clear that at this time this was not quite right. Dan Serridge from the Village Storytelling Centre, along with his team, ran these sessions in the Friesen Galloway. I'm going to hand over now to Dan, so he can tell us a bit more about these conversations and how they help shape local priorities in the Friesen Galloway. Hello, I'm Daniel Serridge from the Village Storytelling Centre, and we have been working alongside LCT for nearly three years now on this programme. In Dumfries and Galloway, uh, our job was to work with people who are unpaid carers, staff and volunteers who work with people with dementia, and an attempt was made to work with people with dementia um, numerous times, but um, as you may be aware, it proved very difficult, but there will be ongoing attempts on this process. Um, so who are the village and who are we and what do we do? Uh, in very simple terms, we're concerned with stories and storytelling. We believe that there is power in everybody's story and everybody's story deserves to be heard. What we want to do is provide a platform, a plinth, a stage or um, a place where we are able to listen. We're able to hear and we're able to give it the space that it deserves and help people recognize that their experiences, their stories, and the act of telling them is artwork and deserves to be treated as such. So our process is about working with people to uncover those stories and to go into it in a way which feels safer. So we talk about a one step removed process, a, a place or a space where people feel they can contribute and offer their own experiences in a way that's both safe and supportive and, and slightly removed as well. I want to talk a little bit about how we do that and what came out of those sessions and how those stories that emerge are turned into something um, that's more deep and has more meaning going forward. We start with a story, we tell a story, a fictional story, a piece of folklore, if you will, because we are initially interested in metaphor and creating archetypes that people can really respond to. The power of telling story about a story about the forest, about a giant, about a group of animals, about whatever it happens to be, is it triggers people's connection, it triggers 
triggers people's associations to important characters and important features that they can recognize and make meaning from. For us, stories only become interesting when an audience or when a group of people place themselves into it. So what begins to emerge is a conversation about why um, a giant may chop wood in the forest can change into what really matters for people with deme in dementia care in Dumfries and Galloway, for example, because we talk about giants perhaps as being figures of huge fear and and scariness when in reality we're surrounded by them and they're often ignored or vilified or left out in the cold like a number of issues and experiences people can have in a caring setting after we explore these ideas after we tell a story and people begin to open up about their own work or about their own experiences we move on to look at care and we use that as a jumping off point to explore what care means in the area within which we're talking in this case from Friesen Galloway and within each area, each and every area we work a care list has been spoken has been read out loud and what I want to do now is just reveal the care list that we came up with in Dumfries and Galloway these are Dumfries and Galloway this is an amalgamation of all the different ideas and thoughts that people had in the area of what care is and how it's defined. So this is a definition and it's this. Care is being there. It's not judgmental, it's accepting, it's consistent. It's a consistent love and attention. It's not not being prepared to get to know someone. It's not looking down your nose. It's not not wondering. It's not not looking. It's not using people. It's sometimes being totally lost. It's a world of uncertainty. It's relying on other professionals. Being on the other side of a relationship. It's about concern. It's about compassion. It's about understanding. It's about connection. It's about connection in a relationship. And it's about mutual benefits. It's about everyone experiencing care. It's about practical help. And it's about something to do with trust. It's about trust. And for us, hearing that list and having a moment to define what care is, what we begin to understand is how much of a connection people have to that term how rich and how raw people feel to that term and how important it is for people to define and i have found working on this program it's an incredible pleasure and privilege to hear people's definition of care because everyone has a hugely deep understanding of what it is because they are doing it day in day out and the power of those words are evident in people's responses to it it's evident in what they say and how they say it and that came about through a story once we've told a story once we've heard this care list what we attempt to do is get that little bit closer to the issues at heart to the issues that matter to people and what's really relevant to the people in that area but we still keep it slightly removed and through a, a process of creating a new character creating a new story we begin to delve into a particular person's experiences internally and externally. How do they feel? And what are the pressures that surround them that are supporting or not supporting the feelings that they're having? And what we discover is everybody within that space contributes to the character, making something up, having fun and playing with it, but also placing their own fears, hopes, emotions, onto those characters and this process particularly works with the unpaid carers with the carers that we've worked with because they are incredibly close to their feelings and their emotions and they're experiencing things that are so deep and so heartfelt on a daily basis that the characters that get created are incredibly rich I don't want to talk a bit about the characters that were created in Rumfries and Galloway because that will all be made available in the packs that come along with this and you'll be able to read those in the report but I think you'll agree that 
There's a richness to them. And we could all look at them and say, I know somebody like this. or I feel a connection to this. Because those characters have been created from the feelings of the people within the space. So you, you may be thinking, well, you've got a great story and you've got a, a character here, but what then happens to all the information that's collected? How do these voices and stories that get heard become something that's mm, used further forward, that's able to be developed and passed on and condensed into something clearer to understand? And that's where our priorities come in. A set of priorities have been created by Life Changes Trust out of the work that we have delivered and the stories that we've created. And I'd like to take a moment to read those to you now. So here are our priorities. I'm just gonna read them out and let them speak for themselves. Each priority is accompanied by a quote from the people to help demonstrate and hopefully underline what we're getting at here. So priority one, peer support is crucial. Having relationships with other carers is so valuable and provides much needed connection with those who share similar experiences. Because of COVID and restrictions, there are a lot of limitations, but care is still what I'm looking for. And I think I will find someone whose story is like mine. But they're ahead of me. I'm hoping that I learn from their story, how to live my life as a carer and to be as good as I can be. Just having that person who's just at the same level, it's actually quite comforting and it makes me feel better. Priority two. There's a real need to improve access to support and to listen to those affected by dementia, those living with it, unpaid carers and families. We need to make sure that people are accessing the things they need at the time they need them. People need respite now. They don't need to wait six to eight weeks. We need better access, more choices to be able to access services in a variety of ways so that people can choose what suits them, makes them feel better. Priority three, communities and the support activities they provide are a vital element in how services should be delivered. Due to the pandemic, there's been a breakdown in connecting to community projects. It's crucial that these relationships begin again. Some of the previous ways people were coming to us as a service would be through community activities, and all of these have stopped. That would have been a way in to begin to get support with us before crisis. Community groups and activities allowed for a slow build of relationships with services, but because of the pandemic, this hasn't been possible. And priority four, care services are exhausted. There's too much work, not enough staff, and not enough med information on access to services. Services do their best to continue to provide support however they can, but even digital engagement has been difficult. People's physical health has been hugely impacted through lockdown and people's cognitive functioning is worsening more than it was pre-COVID. The need for care packages is higher and more complex and we don't have enough care staff. Nothing's changed really. It's always been difficult for people to access services. For years and years we talked about a one-stop shop. There's been a big focus on connecting people digitally but it's not been easy to deliver in Dumfries and Galloway. You see other areas with better engagement and as a result, better opportunities. And so it's been really hard. So as you can see, there's a lot of vital and important information coming out of those priorities. It became clear in Dumfries and Galloway just how much feeling and how much care there was in people's responses, how much perhaps frustration there was to and I think some of those priorities go to help to describe what people have experienced. I said at the beginning, and I say at the beginning of all these presentations and all the sessions that we do, how much of a privilege it is to deliver this work, how lucky we are to 
hear these stories and provide an ear for them. But for us, it's an opportunity to celebrate the stories that have been told and to um, let people know that they have a space and they have a place to tell them. We feel that the, the stories that have been shared in Dumfries and Galloway really do reflect a broad picture of people's feelings and responses to the care that they're giving and being given in the area. And what became clear from the work that I did was just how much of a connection people had to the communities of that area and how close those communities felt. And I wanted to end on just a little quote that I feel feels per pertinent to, to the work that we've done and to the messages we're trying to put across and to gather. Um, and it's this, communities hold stories. They keep each other's secrets. They know each other well enough to accept them, warts and all. And it feels like an important quote because there's a strength in this sense that communities bind together through the stories that they tell each other, that they bond over everyone's needs and that they're willing to accept people no matter what that story is and what their experience is, warts and all. And we hope that our work with Life Changes Trust and on this project has enabled people to feel like they have been able to share their stories warts and all and we hope that these priorities and the work that we've done helps and supports the future of dementia care in Dumfries and Galloway. Thank you for your time. Many thanks to Dan. At the Trust we have really appreciated how storytelling has offered a really unique way for people to express themselves and really be heard. Our next section now will focus on some local projects from across the Dumfries and Galloway area, looking at the vital work they have been doing during the pandemic. First up, we're hearing from Claire Martin, who is a specialist occupational therapist with NHS Dumfries and Galloway. One of the things that Claire specialises in is memory strategies for people who are struggling and need extra support. Here, she talks about how they have provided this type of support when the pandemic hit, and face-to-face -face meetings were no longer possible. She also explains how they provided meaningful occupational therapy for people during this time. At the start of the pandemic, we started to think about how we were going to continue our work. We had been used to seeing people in person, sometimes at home, sometimes in different clinics. And we had to think about how we would cope with not being able to see as many people face to face. The team had a look at things such as telephone appointments, and we started to use those to speak to people experiencing memory problems and their loved ones and we also were using what they call NHS near me which is a video conferencing package that lets you have secure conversations with people and as time went on we became quite used to how everything worked together and we're quite pleased at how things were developing so it was a combination of sending out written information speaking to people on the phone doing some home visits and seeing some people face to face when that was required, but making a lot more use of telephone and video appointments. And I think over this time, we've, we've learned about how useful sometimes that is, that sometimes people prefer just to speak to us by phone rather than traveling a distance um, to see us somewhere. And we're now making the best use of those different types of appointments and you know, thinking about what suits the people that we're talking to best. A lot of what we deliver is around what's called the home-based memory rehabilitation strategies, which is a big title for different approaches to learning new ways to do things that make remembering easier. And we're finding that people are finding it helpful 
to have these conversations with us. That's the feedback we're getting from people that they're quite enjoying some of the video calls because they get to see a face rather than not just hear a voice. And I think people are appreciating that when we do go and see them, that you know we're getting a, a flavour of how things are in their, their home environment as well. So I think we've, we've improved our service perhaps you know, through what happened with the pandemic and we're now able to look at tailoring it to what that person needs and what their, their loved ones needs to help them. Um, now, some of the people we see, they might be diagnosed with things like mild cognitive impairment or different types of dementia. And we know that using memory strategies help people stay well and stay, you know, living well and comfortably at home for longer. Um, so it, you know, it feels a positive piece of work to be doing. As part of our roles as occupational therapists, we also get involved at looking at meaningful occupations for people. And I've been had the pleasure of being involved in a working group which has been looking at animation and how we can use that to tell the story of you know, people who are living with dementia and also how we might use it as a way to explain different memory strategies people might want to use. And one of the gentlemen on our working group is called Danny and he has given a podcast about his life story and we have been working with him to animate that story. And I've got the pleasure of introducing a clip or we could say a trailer for that story that I'll introduce now. Since my diagnosis, um, I was diagnosed with vascular dementia at 52. Prior to that, I was having problems because I was a night shift worker and our computer system had changed. And one of my colleagues spent most of the night going through the new computer system with me. And by the morning, I, I couldn't remember each stage. I went to see a doctor and did the memory tests mm -hmm. and had the CT scan and whatnot, but we're told it was vascular dementia. And I, initially, you feel like your world's come to an end. Um, you don't know where you're going to go next. You don't know what life holds for you. So as you will have seen, Danny's story is, you know, a very personal and moving account of, you know, what he experienced when he first noticed memory problems. And you'll have noticed that the trailer says, you know, coming, coming soon, there'll, there'll be more of his story coming later. And he goes on to give us more information about the new people he's met and the new things he's been doing with his time and how life has really opened up after his diagnosis. So it's quite a positive story and all the more powerful for the fact that, you know, it's someone's own experience. Going forward, I think we're feeling quite positive about the future here in Dumfries and Galloway and making best use of the technology and the, the new developments that we've had to, to work with during the pandemic um, to keep you know, delivering a service and support um, to people struggling with memory problems. Many thanks to Claire and to Danny. We will share the animation in full on our website when it's available. We're now moving on to hear from Alzheimer's Scotland and some of their team. Claire Strohan, locality leader, Mandy Cowan and Shona Sneddon, who are dementia advisors. Shona is also a care liaison worker, as well as Rachel Byers and Jill Rennie, the other two care liaison workers. They talk about their digital journey through the pandemic and we also hear from some of the people they have been supporting. Hi, I'm Mandy Cowan, one of the Dementia Advisors in Dumfries and Galloway. I cover the Nisdale, the Upper Nisdale, the Stewartry and the Anna Nisdale areas. I provide ongoing support, information and advice to anyone who is living with dementia and also to their family and friends who provide care and support to someone who, is, who has dementia. Today, we would like to share with you a little of our digital connections journey and what experiences we've, we've had and what we have learned along the way. I will now hand you over to Shona. 
Hi, I'm Shona Sneddon. I'm the Dementia Advisor and Carer Liaison Worker for Stranraer and Wigtonshire. Mandy has kindly introduced what we do as Dementia Advisor. So as a Carer Liaison Worker, our role is to support the person and their family during transition into long-term care, helping to support and them deal with the emotional challenges and changes that are experienced at this time, and also sadly when a loved one passes away. I'll now hand you on to Jill, who will introduce herself. Hi, I'm Jill Rainey, and I am also a carer liaison worker. I cover the, the sort of middle part of the region called the Stewartry, which is around Gatehouse of Fleet, Castle Douglas, and also parts of Dumfries area. I'll now pass you on to my colleague, Rachel. Hello, I'm Rachel Byers and I work as care liaison worker also. I work in the east of the region in Annandale and Estale and also north of Dumfries, which is up in Estale. So now we're going to look at our digital connections journey um, and really explore first what, what is the story. So prior to the pandemic, we supported carers mainly face to face either at support groups, of which we had eight across the region, or from our resource centres in Stranraer and Dumfries, or through Hungary. After, After the pandemic, we had to completely change our way of working and move to mainly telephone support. The majority of carers we supported via landline, as they had no mobile or other technology. We made weekly calls to many during the initial period, as we were all adjusting to the huge changes that lockdown brought. We introduced Attend Anywhere as a digital platform, but had very little engagement with carers. Though the few times we did use it, it proved very useful. For example, when speaking with a relative who lived overseas. As a team, we then began to use Microsoft Teams, which quickly became the preferred medium. We began to have one-to-one -one video calls with carers, and this helped by the provision, this was helped by the provision of nine iPads um, for carers from the Connecting Scotland initiative. It was at this stage we began planning our first digital group, a care home relative support group. The majority of carers preferred to continue with telephone support, but some were keen to give the digital group a try. We offered one-to-one -one sessions initially to those wishing to join until they felt confident using Microsoft Teams before they all joined their first group session together. Initially, we ran the group as a pilot of three sessions, which was held monthly and lasted for about an hour and a half. Since then, as restrictions have eased further, we've also just restarted face-to-face -face carer support groups, which we will also touch on. We will now go on to Jill, who will describe what was the learning. Hi. So, really, we decided that we would split what the learning was into kind of two sections. So, first of all, I'd like to talk about the challenges. So initially, the challenges were encouraging the, the family carers to actually engage in the digi digital groups. They may not have had up-to-date equipment, which wasn't compatible with recent updated technology. So some of them had sort of laptops that were rather old and wouldn't connect. So we had to give them a lot of support to, to enable them to connect to this. They, they, have, they may have low self-esteem. They may have been lacking in confidence. Are, are kind of frightened of using the technology. So they did require a lot of encouragement and support from the dementia advisors and carer liaisons. It did help when we had a good working relationship with them. Engaging with the technology also may not be high on their priority list. So they have a lot of things going on in their life. So again, we had to give them a lot of encouragement and support. Although our, our rural area that we live in is very beautiful, it does have its problems. We have poor infrastructure and there's low investment compared to other areas in Scotland. Dumfries and Galloway can, has poor connectivity, Wi-Fi is temperamental, broadband can be slow and our phone signals can be quite patchy. So these are some of the challenges we faced. Ongoing IT support was needed for, for the families and also for our, ourselves as staff. At the start of the pandemic, we did a survey showing that engaging in digital options was not the pre preference of family carers. I'd like to move on now to the positives and hand over to Mandy. Thanks, Jill. 
So now looking at some of the positives that have come out of the pandemic and the benefits of using online services. As we established our new online services, some of the family members um, provided us with some really good feedback many of whom were quite keen to engage with the new way of working online. It enabled some of the carers to begin to develop brand new IT skills, and for others, they had the opportunity to refresh some of those existing skills. Carers from one of our groups, some of the carers from the groups have helped us with other developments, for example, taking part in a webinar and providing useful feedback from which we could learn and embed in other sessions. Being able to link with carers from across the region was also very beneficial, and it enabled them to meet people that they might not have had the opportunity to meet before. Staff also from across the region had the opportunity to work together on a more regular basis. Carers told us that being able to attend the digital meetings meant it had less impact on their day, meaning that the family member, the the family carer, spent less time away from the person who they were supporting, and there wasn't the same need for respite. Another bonus was there was no need for travelling, as the meetings were all held in the comfort of the person's own home. Some of the other benefits from using technologies were included, included a lot more use of text between carers and staff, which has reduced the waiting time for support as you don't miss each other's calls. There was also much more use of emails, which provided carers a time to prepare their questions, and they prepared these quite often at a time that was more suitable to them, more convenient, and away from their care and responsibilities. Being online has also overcome the geographics, and it has meant that one call can include several members of the family at once, on an online meeting. And this was particularly helpful during the lockdown when travel restrictions were in place. So from here, let's move on to our online group support. Handing over to Shona. This wonderful photograph is a photograph of one of our care home relatives online support group, um, which has been been regularly. by four um, carers, and the following slides show clips from the first one is of Andy. So hi Andy, it's uh, good to see you again, and um, I'd, I just wondered if we could talk a bit about the the, the carers group, the digital group that you you're you're part of and um, just tell me kind of what what you what how you find it you know do do you enjoy it just tell me about your thoughts yeah I I, I thought it was great I mean uh, I I, I think uh, you know you're looking at people that are very much in the same situation as yourself and they a uh, I suppose it's like a lot of other things. You, you've got to be in a a, a, a situation to, to form a, a you know a real understanding of, because the stage that we're all at now. I mean, we've we've gradually been learning this since we see where 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 loved ones uh, gradually moving into the illness, you know, dementia. Or, a uh, Alzheimer's, whatever it is, and we're seeing them gradually moving into it, you know, and, and we, we develop an understanding of it. And, they, and, and you can see it in the people that you're talking to. You know, it's, it's you know, it's, uh, it's there, you can see it there. And, and because we're going through the same thing, a uh, uh, there's there's almost a, a bit of a bond mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. there, you know. Yeah. So so I think that they uh, it is it is great for the for the people that they uh, <clears throat> first of all they allow themselves to 
you know, to, to go into that, that situation. And uh, it it can almost be a bit, oh, how, how can you say? It's uh, relaxing, I suppose, you can say, when, when you actually move into it, you know, because uh, nobody's going to be pressurising anybody. Uh, uh, and uh, I, th I think I think it's 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 well worth the time, you know. Yeah. I really do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And how did you find the kind of trying to connect digitally? Uh, I think uh, <laughs> there's, there's there's things about the uh, uh, connecting digitally. And, and actually being there with somebody. I mean, I, I, I think the, the, the digital link up, I think it's incredible whether the whether the pictures know 100%, uh, whether what you're getting a bit of interference or whatever, it's, it's, it's still brilliant. It's still amazing. I mean, a few years ago, you, you would never have thought it was possible. So, so it's it's a it's it's a an amazing advance, you know, and a, uh, and 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 I've no doubt it'll it'll probably get better as it goes on. But but it, I would think I would think a uh, that if there's a group of people sitting in a room, and a, uh, a, as I've just said the they've they've got this experience uh, of, of dementia uh, we're, we're all in the same boat that we've got this bond uh, and and if we're all sitting in a room then I, I, I would probably give that 10 out of 10 where <laughs> the, the the digital thing I, I might just say nine out of ten, you know, because because the digitals may be liable to just go blank at any minute. But whereas <laughs> when we're all sitting in a room, you're you're there, and and yeah. that's you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Had you done? A, a bit of uh, connecting over the internet before with family, or or was I, this a new experience? I it's incredible. My daughter lives uh, an hour away from here at, at Stonehouse, and they uh, well they keep saying they're needing a new laptop, uh, but but some night, some days I go on the Skype, and the 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 repute the reception's just no good. It's pretty, yeah. pretty but yet I can talk to my son. He's sixty odd miles north of Los Angeles, and and you would think he was just sitting in the room. the The reception can be absolutely brilliant. Yeah. Uh, and but I suppose you know I suppose uh, this is where technology. As amazing as it is, it's uh, it's maybe no just just perfect yet. Like you know, yeah, yeah. a uh, long way to go. Eh? <laughs> uh, 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 yeah, uh. yeah. Okay. So, mm. Well, that's great, Andy. Well, thank you so much for sharing your experiences with me. No and uh, we'll speak to you again soon. Okay then. Thank you very much. And then finally. On Tuesday, the 29th of June, 15 months since we had last had the opportunity to meet face to face, we had our first carer support group meeting at our Stranra Dementia Resource Centre. Because of current restrictions, we were unfortunately unable to meet as a whole group, but instead met as two smaller groups. It was lovely to see familiar faces again. But I will leave the last words to David and Jesse, who I feel sum up beautifully how it felt to be back seeing each other again and what it means to them to be back at our carer support group. OK, so David, welcome to our first carer support group. Would you like to tell us how it feels to be back? Well, I've been isolated for 
almost 18 months. It's wonderful to meet people again. It's, it's, a lot of people say, get out and about, but you miss the company, especially once you've got older, man. And it's, uh, my daughter and son-in-law had to go back to work for the vaccinations and that. And it's a long, long day when you're sitting in the house in your own. And for to get out and about now and meet Jesse and Shona and that, it's absolutely wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you. So Jesse, same question to yourself. How does it feel to be back at the Carer Support Group? Well, this is the first time that I've been back since COVID where we had to isolate a year past March. And uh, I haven't been out above three times since then. There's a lady from Age Concern rings me once a week. She lives in London and I look very forward to speaking to her. And also Shona rings me up and lets me know what's happening out there. Today we've had this meeting and just the mere fact that I took a longer time to get washed and dressed and a bit of makeup on, I felt like a different person. And I've really enjoyed this break here today and I hope that it'll continue and get more and more people each week because it's missed. Many thanks to Claire, Mandy, Shona, Rachel and Jill, and of course to Andy, Kate and Jessie. Lastly, we'll now hear from Michelle Bourne, who is an IDEAS specialist occupational therapist. As I mentioned before, IDEAS stands for Interventions for Dementia, Education, Assessment and Support. Michelle shares with us some of her work creating a community of practice for COVID-friendly activity in care homes and talks about the importance of meaningful occupational therapy and dementia, as well as her local care home activity coordinators forum. Hello, my name's Michelle Bourne. I'm an occupational therapist working in mental health for over 15 years within older adults and individuals with a diagnosis of dementia. Recently in April, I moved into the IDEAS team, which is Interventions for Dementia, Education, Assessment and Support. Um, as part of that role, one of the big things that we look at is helping to reduce stress and distress behaviours with people with a diagnosis of dementia in care homes. An important factor of that um, especially within my role, is looking at meaningful activities that can help to support individuals with a dementia. Um, so we know that obviously people with dementia lose a lot of their abilities that they've had in life. So it's really important that they have meaningful activities that they can connect with, that can help them to exercise their brain, help with stimulation, help with social contact and help with quality of life. We know that individuals with dementia who have access to activities that are important to them helps to reduce the stress and distress behaviours that they might otherwise experience if they were bored or they had nothing to do or they didn't feel a connection with anything. One of the difficulties um, recently, obviously, with COVID is the lack of social support. So again, the importance of having meaningful occupation and being over, having other ways to access social supports has been really important. So as part of my role as the occupational therapist within the IDEAS team, one of the things that I've tried to um, establish is a forum for all the activities coordinators within the care homes. The activities coordinators play a vital role in looking at activities and supports that can help individuals engage in things that they would like. 
I and I think that's been especially difficult, obviously, because of a lot of the restrictions that have been put in place and the restrictions during COVID of having visitors or guest speakers or people coming in. So one of the things that I was really keen to do was help to re-establish and create a forum for the activities coordinators, which we did via Teams. <clears throat> so all of the care homes in Dumfries and Galloway were invited to join us um, via Teams and really just look at them being able to discuss any concerns that they've had um, peer support for them and to sharing best practice. Um, we have had a good um, number of members attending that have felt it's really useful. It also gives them the ability to problem solve some of the difficulties that they've had in terms of having to do a lot more one-on-one -on -one activities. Another part of the network for myself has been helping to support them looking at COVID friendly activities and using virtual networks to allow support to do that. Um, I know that one of the care homes that they won't mind me mentioning had a brilliant initiative and they did, they do themes every month for different countries. Um, they use a virtual forums with individuals in their room to two of the different countries have themed menus um, the the staff dressed up and the activities coordinator gave all the individuals in passports which they stamp every month when they're going round um, to each individual. Um, we have obviously now we're starting to see things relax, which is better. Um, I think during the most difficult time of COVID, one of the other things was helping people to stay connected with their families, which again, with people with dementia who have difficulty with recall, it's really important that we help to maintain those links. So using digital technology to be able to contact family was obviously another vital part of their role to help people stay connected. As things are now starting to relax, we're pleased to hear that visitors can now obviously go in obviously with the obviously with the protections to keep everybody safe. <laughs> Um, the care homes are really keen to share, the activities coordinators are really keen to share the different ideas and activities that they've been using within the forum. And I am keen that we establish meeting on a monthly basis. Um, they've had really positive feedback from residents and family about the activities and the interventions and the fact that they have helped to improve quality of life for individuals with dementia during this difficult time, giving them something meaningful and purposeful for them individually and now socially distanced, moving back into groups so they can have a bit more social um, interaction. Also, as well as having the monthly meetings, if there's anything that they feel they need a bit of support with, or if there's any advice that they feel that I could offer or anybody else within the group, there is that forum to do that and to share ideas. I know that I can help to coordinate that. So one of the activities coordinators had sent a calendar of events of the year, which can be good in terms of helping to decide what to do on an activity that day. So it gives you a theme for doing things. So they were able to send that to me and I can distribute it. Um, the activities coordinators themselves have got absolutely brilliant ideas they've you know faced a lot of difficulties and managed to keep going 
I think it's so important and we know it's so important that individuals with dementia are able to still stay engaged, still do things that they enjoy, you know, still use being able to think about things and um, we know that that does help with not only quality of life, but will help them to stay more alert and engaged. So moving forward, it's continuing to keep up the, the links via Teams, which we've been doing virtually. Hopefully the idea is that when things begin to relax more, we might be able to be me um in person as well um probably within localities um i suppose the benefits of having the teams meetings though means that all um activity homes across the network of the area of dumfries and galloway have had the opportunity to all meet which sometimes can be quite difficult with the geographics of the area so I'm just really keen moving forward to help support them in any way I can to highlight the good practice. Um, one of the other things that we agreed was that we would showcase some of the work that the care homes are doing on our ideas Facebook page to share the really good practice and to help promote the great work that they're doing. So moving forward, that's what we're going to continue to do. Um, and just any, any difficulties that they're having, any support that they need, um, looking at any kind of funding um possibilities that are available and really the benefits of the individual and just acknowledging the hard work that they have put into supporting all these individuals with dementia and the benefits that 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 has demonstrated so one of the other things that we've been looking at um, to help promote the great work that the activity coordinators that have been doing within the care homes is for them to have an opportunity to showcase their good work and excellent practice on our Facebook page. Um, so I would really encourage you to come have a look at our ideas Facebook page and see for yourself. A big thank you to Michelle and to everyone who has shared their experiences and insights with us for this webinar. We are very grateful for all of the work you're doing and for taking the time to share this with us. This now brings us to the end of this recorded webinar. It has been my pleasure to take you through it and we hope everyone has enjoyed it. My call to action to you all is to use this learning in your own communities, the places you work and share it with the people you meet, connect with and work alongside. It is important that what people have shared through the storytelling sessions and as part of the project presentations informs and also influences dementia policy and practice now and in the future. This marks the start of new conversations and opportunities for change. If you have any questions or queries about this webinar, please do get in touch. Our contact details are on the Life Changes Trust website. Thanks again and goodbye.